record on the computer. Welcome everyone to our Thursday, November 16th meeting of the Supply Chain and Trade Finance SIG. I'm going to share the agenda into the chat right there. Um, got a really exciting, uh, like a, a nice um, meeting today where some planning and then we're going to hear from a very special guest, Jim Lorenzo Meggio, speaking about his European Commission report. So Jim Lorenzo, welcome officially. Um, wow, yeah. Yeah. We've got Jeff here, we have David here, and of course Tom. My name is Alicia Noel. And on the agenda today, we've got some upcoming events we just want to mention. In two weeks, our meeting, we will be hosting Mario Reigel of PPI, he's coming over from Germany, on leveraging ISO 20022. And that meeting is at a special time. So that's going to be at um, 4 p.m. Central European time, 10 a.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific. So 7, just want 7 a.m. Pacific. Sorry, yes, 7 a.m. Pacific, thank you. 7 a.m. Yeah. Pacific. Uh, we wanna make sure that everyone is aware that it's not at our usual 12 noon Eastern, 6 p.m. CET time slot. Um, and then in December, on December 4th, there's going to be a Hyperledger member summit in Tokyo. So those of you who are in Asia, that's that would be a good event to attend. Um, as for our, do, do we have any, before we move on, do we have any announcements to make related to the SIG or Hyperledger? If you already have on the agenda, the yeah. ebook announcement, would you like to talk about that? Or yeah, well, maybe... our meeting two weeks ago, we officially launched our supply chain and trade finance ebook. The official title is Hyperledger in Action Supply Chain and Trade Finance. So those of you who are interested you can go to the agenda from that meeting and you'll see us discussing each of the profiles in it. It's a great resource because not only does it have information about how supply chain and trade finance are leveraging blockchain, but we have one page profiles on seven different platforms, seven different solutions that are live being used daily um, by international companies to manage their supply chains and to manage trade finance. So that's really useful. We also have a section where we highlight additional projects that didn't meet the requirements to get a full page, full page profile, but we did think we're worth highlighting. And uh, also on the ebook, we just learned recently that Hyperledger is going to be translating that ebook into both Japanese and Chinese. So that's going to help us reach an even wider audience. Very excited about that. And Hyperledger is starting to promote that. And there's going to be much more uh, publicity yes. via the Hyperledger channels here uh, over the next two, three weeks. Mm -hmm. So it'll be in the Hyperledger newsletter uh, that you get regularly. Uh, there'll be some announcements pushed out. So uh, look for that also. So nice. multiple places. And one one last, I guess, one thing I'll add to that, Alicia, is that the we, uh, we talked about this last time. We're putting this ebook out, but we're viewing this ebook as a updatable document that uh, we'll be able to either bring in additional uh, case studies as we uh, learn about them or the ones that as they progress along and have additional information, additional successes, we'll be able to bring, bring them along because uh, there's there's been a lot of waving of hands about how great blockchain solutions are out there. And so we spent a lot of time making sure that we had blockchain solutions in this ebook that are real, real, real ones that are actually providing value, business value for organizations uh, there. That's right. 
I mean, one one of the well, as you were reviewing so many different profiles, a lot of people were suggesting ones where we weren't able to find publicly available information on what the benefits were, on savings, other efficiencies, and that was one thing we really wanted. We we stressed, so that was important to us for companies that got the full page profile. So can I ask, um, what's the governance around the ebook right now? So can we? download and give it to somebody, can we just reference somebody at BP that I keep in contact with? I was asked what I was up to and I said, I talked about the ebook. He said, I'd like to see that. So we get, it's just- It's publicly available. So it's it's send out there. The link, send them the link. Okay, okay. Send so them the okay link. Just to say, take a look, okay. Yeah, we, right. I mean, we've put it up on LinkedIn as well. I shared it to Discord. Mm -hmm. Trust Your Supplier has also shared it over their LinkedIn. Okay. Yeah, and I asked, <clears throat> okay. I asked Andrea to, um, to boost the Trust Your Supplier post about it as well. Okay. Yeah. All right. And I sent it to the White House and they're, they're looking it over. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I don't know why it's White that. House. <laughs> That's right. I actually, I, actually, I actually did. I sent an email. I sent, when the White House website came up back, this is a quick story in the 90s when Bill Clinton was president. I thought, what the hell? I'll send a note out there. So I had just been to Washington, D.C. and made a comment about how they blocked the roads off around the White House because of security. And damn it, I still have it. He wrote me a letter back. I hit really? some nerve. He oh signed my. it. Goodness. Now he may not have written it, but he signed it and uh, it's an actual signature and there's not initials behind it, which means they signed it for him. And I still have it. It came in this big green envelope. <laughs> it was so new. I think they, oh, we got something here. Oh, that's brilliant. And I, I hit a nerve for some reason. Uh, I commented on how well the time he was doing back then, the internet, things like that. And then I made a comment about this blocking off around the backside of the White House is kind of confusing. And he made all this about reimbursing the District of Columbia and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and some of my kids used to take it to school to show people a letter from Bill Clinton. Oh, that's so funny. Did <laughs> it was typed. It was, it, I would expect it was. Ha have you framed it? Head. No, no, I got it in an envelope that's yeah. a, you know, a light greenish envelope that came in White House stamped on the front and then uh, somebody know about that kind of stuff said he obviously somebody obviously saw it and his staff thought it was important to address but I wrote it up gave it to him he looked it over and then he made changes and then he signed it yeah yeah that sounds about but right they said if, if you see a signature and then a little slash and initials that could be somebody signing his name for him it's but no initials so no no it's yeah I was you know, you, you knew what was, you knew that this was an important issue. Well done, Jeff. Well, the funniest thing I saw doing some work with the government through the oil company was I sent an electronic, essentially email. It was sent back through written postage instead of replying to an email. That's what I thought was so funny. Yeah. That anyway, is, oh, I'll send it to the White House. Dude, yes. And I'd be curious to see if you, what your response is. <laughs> So those of you who are interested FBI in ebook, yeah, it's up on our LinkedIn, it's up on the wiki from last week, and you're going to be getting an email from Hyperledger for those of you who subscribe there. So next up, in our LinkedIn. Is it underneath Andrea? Is no, if LinkedIn? there's a LinkedIn specifically for the Hyperledger supply chain and trade finance SIG. Oh, and he usually okay. tags all of us when he posts things. I'm pretty sure he did for that. Um, and then next up. Okay. Just okay. let you know, I'm going to post it underneath. There, there's a supply chain LinkedIn group underneath this company that has a lot of action underneath it. And that's going to stick oh, great. Right great. Yeah, I posted it to one or two supply chain groups on LinkedIn as okay. well. And I yeah, posted it to the one. Discord. I posted it to a couple of WeChat mm -hmm. groups. Um, Jen Lorenzo, uh, Jen Lorenzo posted the link to the chat. Thank you. Um, and oh, I see. Okay. yeah, Great. it's easy for everybody. And then next up, we're in mid November of 2023. So it's time for us to really start talking about what we want to do next year. What's our 2024 planning? 
this could be speakers, this could be projects. How do people want to get involved? Uh, so we have one or two speakers who had to postpone the presentations from this year that are on our list to get in back in touch with in December and in January to see when they can speak next year. But we'd love to hear from everybody who you'd like to see coming in to present. And also, you know, we, we finished the ebook. So, yes, we will be taking submissions of additional platforms to add in, but that's probably not, we're probably not going to do another, do a major edit for another nine months to a year. So, what do we want to focus on for <clears throat> the beginning of 2024? David, you've been coming for a few months now. I'm glad to see you coming back. Are there any projects that you think would add value to the community and that you might be interested in being part of? Uh, it was random, so I'm, I'm kind of trying to think about it, but uh, there's some interesting projects I've been, I've been seeing how we can build uh, and just trying to extend. I think uh, we had a session with uh, the guys from uh, the guys who are talking about standardizing blockchain technologies and uh, creating those standards and making them available. Uh, standards that we can build on for for, for trying to uh, what's the standardize supply chain technologies that are being built on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a very interesting call. If we can extend something like that. Okay. Uh, well, actually, extend yeah. it. Uh, so uh, how about int introducing it into trade and revenue uh, for systems that are having, uh, for, let me say, communities and, uh, for, ex for instance, we have the uh, Ecoas and all those. All these companies come together and uh, they achieve they they are, they are allowed by a lateral trade or something. So how about we use we, we build something that can encompass something like that? It, I mm -hmm. think it to be a very a very nice adoption to kind of ease trade. Uh, mm -hmm. in terms of, in terms of, and also we can track economic growth as well. So it is something that you build on top of um, trade uh, on, on top of supply chain and something I've been thinking about. So. Mm -hmm. uh, systems focused on revenue and economic growth yeah. yeah are there any systems you've seen already that you think hit sweet spots around that uh currently uh, uh i've not seen any that's why mm -hmm. i've not seen any maybe they're there and people are just still building them or something but yeah, mm -hmm. maybe that's kind of wonders what what this brings the value that this brings so a number of players will come in. Uh, these are the countries and their 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 rights officials, and then they will be able to track and and uh, monitor how the trade how the trade how bilateral trade and maybe international trade is going on. Uh, it allows exchange of documents and uh, also taxes can be can be levied in time and the right amount. Uh, according to the standards upgrade, it, it's kind of I'm not I'm not a product manager, but that's how it kind of works with the whole idea uh, mm -hmm. into. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we did have UAE Trade Connect come and speak a few months ago. One of the platforms that we included in the ebook that we just had a blurb about was B Connect, out of Brazil. That's working with the Mercosur countries for cross-border trade and that's one of the companies we have on our radar to ask them to come in next year and present on the work they're doing um, that's, that's amazing. yeah the standards piece because you mentioned standards at the beginning the presentation in two weeks with david uh sorry with mario reichel he'll be talking about leveraging iso 2000 iso 20022 and that's the standard for, uh, or that's a standard around cross-border payments. 
So the full title of this presentation is Leveraging ISO 20022 to Optimize Supply Chain and Trade Finance Management Platforms, Harmonized ISO 20022 for Cross-Border Payments, a data model also for blockchain solutions and logistics. Um, so that, I think that's something you're going to be, that will be interesting for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. David, this is, this is Tom. Quick question for you: Are you think in terms of monitoring international trade? Are you thinking about monitoring at a company level, or are you thinking monitoring at a governmental level, or are you thinking both? Um, so this can be rolled out. I think a document, the com a document, the government can take a while, but that would be the the right point to to plug into this. Uh, because when you have the government signing up onto this, then the companies uh, would also naturally jump on. Mm -hmm. uh, so, basing on looking at it from a, a government and uh, a more, a more, uh, what's that? I don't want to say political sense, uh, <laughs> but a more admi administrative sense, uh, yeah. and then extending it downwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're saying basically, hey, if government jumps on it, then companies will kind of come along. Yeah. It's almost a re little regulatory thing. Okay. Es Estonia has adopted blockchain for a lot of things, digital identity, a, a lot of business issues. They've made themselves a huge hub. I'm not sure if they're using something blockchain backed to mat to to manage their um their exports and imports That's though. That's a good question. I haven't heard anything really on Estonia yeah. recently and what they're up to. Yeah. Um, might be worth, worth, worth investigating. Um, we could even ask how much they're using Hyperledger right. as opposed to something else. I did see something this morning about JPM coin and how it's actually now being used effectively. It's actually based on private Ethereum. Mm -hmm. Um so basically it would be the uh, linkage there, but they actually got people doing settlements uh, using that blockchain now. So, hmm. That's yeah, interesting. so somewhat so similar to the, I think UAE Trade Connect and probably the Mercusur, the B Connect. Right. Thing. I can't remember. Uh, <clears throat> so that was JP Morgan coin and they got out of that and they sold it to somebody. Now who, you know, Tom, who runs it? Um, um, I was well, looking at it once. JP Morgan coin still exists. So, right. so that, that's not JP Morgan. They had Quorum. They had their own version of Ethereum called Quorum that they right. sold that, to cons that they block. sold to consensus because they didn't want to be yeah. um building the building blocks. And then the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, right, kind of took over the overall. Hey, here's 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 how we're gonna do private Ethereum, which One is word, sits. similar to you know what you can do with fabric, right? And hyperledger products. Mm -hmm. Um, so they saw what we've seen with Hyperledger, the ability within an enterprise to have a system um, can make it much more powerful and much more adaptable. Right. Yeah, I couldn't figure out what they were doing with it because it's almost like they didn't understand what they were. It's kind of like uh, <clears throat> Facebook was going to call it a coin. I don't think they understood what coins are for. Yeah. When it comes down There's to actually... it, they're, they're, they're used to run blockchains. They're the gas behind them. Fundamentally, that's what they are. We got to sit yeah. on the blockchain in the rewards. Um, and if you have a private blockchain on fabric, you don't need coins. So JP Morgan came out with this. I saw the white paper. Somebody JP Morgan gave it to me. And I read it. And I thought, what on earth? You guys are financial group. Yeah. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah. No. Well, yeah. the article. <laughs> I'll, I don't know what it's I'll based you... on. Yeah. Maybe David and Alicia, I'll let you sh sh go a little bit. I'll try to find the article here and all this place in the chat. To kind That's of go interesting. Along. Yeah. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Thank you. It came, in the new, it came in a Fortune newsletter this morning. Mm -hmm. Here, I would catch up with it. It's easy to be horrible to everybody, so I'll put it in the chat. <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you. I mean, we can also forward things over the listserv email so that people who aren't here in real time but do watch over the video, do watch it on YouTube, get access to it as well. Yeah. 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 So... Anyway, I think no, so. Yeah. Uh, make sure this is, yeah, this is recorded. Yeah, okay. So, 
Where's my screen? Oh, no, no one. Can I make the noise? Mm. Okay. Okay. So I think moving on, just want to say okay. if anyone has ideas on <laughs> potential speakers, but projects and wants to get more involved, please come to a meeting in person and or send us an email. Um, and we can we can talk about different ways for people to get involved. And yes, I um, since our budget's unlimited, <laughs> when you think about it, <laughs> mm -hmm. our unlimited budget. So I've been trying to think of what things I can really sink my teeth into for projects that we can get people involved. And I just came up with a few more off the top of my head, but I don't know. Um, you know, I've only been in, in this SIG for eight months, maybe six months, I don't know, something like that. Um, I was in a couple other SIGs. And um, what, what's the, what's the, uh, what's the right word? What's the flavor of projects that we're looking for? Is it presentations? Is it, um, you know, like the ebook was really great. Uh, what if, is there anything deeper that falls with supply chain? I was always wondering how supply chain supply chain software, specifically fabric, fits into systems and companies like their ancient SAP systems mm -hmm. or trading desks where you've got mutability, which is big, which you would think that our voting would be using the blockchain, but never mind on that. But you know, trading desks that sit there and hedge and they literally get less than information, hopefully less than information on inventories in places and it's going on during their transportation. And they, they, you know, I'm not. A, I worked with traders for five years on, on the petroleum trading logistics, but um, I'm not an expert on it. But I do know that they send look for opportunities. Why do we have traders? They look for opportunities where there's a supply or an inventory issue in one section of the country or the world, and they sit there and they kind of smooth that out for profit. So they make traders make a lot of things smooth in our world. A tanker gets stuck on the middle ocean, and the refinery's waiting for it, and so they have a gasoline shortage and. Uh, Chicago and New York area, they swap fuels and they bring stuff in right away to take care of that for a profit. They hedge stuff. And so that is so that's all supply chain stuff. But are traders out there using any blockchains today where they're getting IoT data, inventory data, um, mutable data, which is really key because when you're a trader, all your stuff is tracked, things you say on the phone, things that you type on on a monitor, a, 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 a screen. Um, that stuff is key. It's when you say trader, you mean that. it sounds like you're specifically meaning investment trading. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm yeah. a I'm a wheat trader, a commodities trader, and I'm sitting there. And how do you make money, Jeff? Well, I look out for opportunities about climate. I look for what's going on in the supply chain world. What's the harvest looking like? Are there are the silos in the farm area plugged up for some reason because they can't? Uh, there's something wrong with the railroads and this kind of stuff happening. So in my silos, my farm co-op are. are filled and so that affects prices and they sit in the middle of this thing and they figure out ways to smooth that out and now I'll, I'll give you this and I'll, I'll take care of this for you I'll take care of this for you and they, and they hedge those prices and they make lots of money that way um to give you an example when I was at BP when COVID hit price of, they were paying people to take crude oil remember that pardon there's nowhere to put it anymore they were paying people to take crude oil instead of you buying it they were paying people um because the tanks were being filled COVID shut everything down the supply was just pouring in and so bp had an empty tanker that had loaded out in uh, the gulf uh, mexico and so they were paid um 100 million dollars to take crude off people's hands and they turned wow. around they held it in port and then they sold it off they made another couple hundred million dollars the traders did that it was all about supply chain they knew where things were at the right time is right. any so my long-winded thing is there any interest in digging into stuff like that to see how supply chain software can be or is, is being used in trade desks um things like, things like that more like detailed is there any interest in that at all but it's more than the it's a little bit deeper than the ebook right it's a lot deeper um yeah business-wise and technically deeper i, know, I was looking I... at this too Right. Oh, it says I have a lot of time, somewhat time on my hands. Um, I'm trying to think about stuff to do in 2024. Mm -hmm. I really dig my teeth into. It. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's interesting from a finance perspective. Um, 
I'm if there are projects that are using Hyperledger for that, I think it's worthwhile to like, have them come speak and to document them, put them in. Um, yeah, do we have people in, in if that's not, you know, it's, it's uh, if that's not out there today, who takes that kind of information and goes to those, goes to trading firms and saying, you can be doing A, B, C, D, and E, because if you look at like some of the stuff in the, in the ebook, somebody right. at some point brought that stuff to those companies and say, here's what you can do with hydro the fabric and supply chain. Mm -hmm. And they adopted it and used it. Right. Who does that? It's who investigates to see what use cases are. Uh, for different things out there are equitable. Somebody does that. So, I mean, I think yeah. some of the news it's not in those companies. Yeah, some of the consulting firms do. I bet some of the insurance firms do. Um, I'm sure the insurance firms right now are doing a lot with AI. I know they've been doing a lot in prior years with remote sensing data, with data coming from satellites especially around weather weather events drought um, mm -hmm. tracking ships both for um tracking how commodities are moving but even remote sensing data has been leveraged for tracking human trafficking um is there any interest in, in, in putting together something? Again, these are things that, um, you know, I, I tend to a lot of these meetups, these hyper like these things, and it's a lot of, um, <clears throat> a lot of stuff is use case, but it's also, here's what our software can do. Mm -hmm. And so, um, can um, fabric, supply chain using fabric and AI be of a advantage? advantage? This is how we think this would work. It doesn't have to be a solution that's out there, but it's all slides. Are, is there an interest in, spending time digging down into stuff that our group presents as, I'm not saying experts, but information around those topics. Whereas um, this thing could be, uh, what's going on with supply chain and AI, anything? Um, and I, I know those kind of questions actually are sitting out there today. And um, do we have documents or our presentations that we can do to show what can be done? Not what's being done, but what can be done with it. I know corporations are really struggling with AI because they've been forced to invest in it and they don't know what the hell to do with it. Um. I think I think there's still a lot of issues around some of the AI, AI platforms, accuracy of data. Also. Accuracy, there's and, and there's a monster sitting out there. There's an absolute monster on AI that nobody talks about that's going to have to be addressed. Um, you know, AI, the, the amount of computing power that is required to run AI is immense. Yeah. I mean, it's immense. And the greenhouse gas emissions and so forth, that, you know, um, the vectorized data, you know, that's really AI, the vectorization of the data. To do that work, uh, <laughs> I heard stuff like every run uses enough power to to uh, enough power, uh, the same amount of power that 100,000 homes use in a whole year. No, so it's about right. There's not enough energy in a grid to have massive adoption of AI. That's this conundrum that's sitting out there. Um, that like, brings up actually huge. something interesting. Remember how a couple of years ago some governments were banning token mining because of the energy right. use? They I wonder are, at what point yeah. we're going to see governments banning hosting AI servers yeah. also because of the power use. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think you know, it's... Um, the, the way the way some countries are doing it now is they're transitioning into uh large solar solar farms. Mm -hmm. Uh so it's in Kenya. Uh, they they opened the large they they opened the large mining Farm and it's it's basically powered by solar, which is natural energy. Uh, I've also seen a lot of investments in Canada as well in that. Mm -hmm. um, but like like uh, Jeff says, uh, it's really immense the computing power you need. Uh, so uh, how 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 can it, how is how uh, how reliable is it? Is is there going to be the the dominant factor that we see because of those costs? Mm -hmm. I see a lot yeah. of uh, you know, a lot of uh, cloud providers right now are the ones providing 
computing power for that, but isn't isn't the cost being driven there as well? Uh, well, Google was on TV saying they're in a real pickle because they've got an AI. Um, they've got a good AI, but at the same time, they have a net zero commitment of 2050. And as they push AI, they're going in the wrong direction. So, yeah, that's um, true. mutually exclusive. Because I know, you know in the US, I think the uh, windmill consortium have said if they don't get $4.87 billion from US government subsidies, then our windmill infrastructure in the United States is going to shut off. How much of our power anymore. comes from windmills in the U.S.? It's tiny, but again, it's, it's, it loses lots of money. Um, right. And they're finding out that some of the, you know, not that they've been running, a lot of the parts aren't reliable as they thought. There's a lot more maintenance than they thought. So, mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, it's, it's, well, I mean, that's off, uh, oh, hit the wrong button here. Maybe that's off topic, but, um, I think yeah, this I'm is worth researching. Yeah. I'm always yeah, I'm always interested in researching stuff that see what we can do. I did for the for the, the climate accounting sig. I did a uh, out of the blue um, climate accounting sig doesn't have a solution. They sit there and say adopt this. They have how how fabric can be used to uh, do carbon accounting in different right. phases of carbon accounting. And so I went out and did a comparative study of offers that are out there. Um, who sells climate accounting software? How comprehensive are they? They cover everything? No. Do they do the calculations right in the standard way? No. So I, I, I did that kind of stuff. But the, um, the climate accounting SIG does a lot of stuff where here's our software fabric and all the different projects around it. Here's how we can use this for climate accounting. We want to do some of that stuff in supply chain. Mm -hmm. I think this is something we're going to have to continue the discussion at uh, the next meeting. Just being mindful of time, it's 35 after the hour, 36 after the hour, and we had asked, Jean Lorenzo is here to uh, oh, present. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. So let's continue the discussion, probably not next meeting, but in January. Make sense? Yep. Maybe I'll dig in with some other ideas around this. That'd be great. And yeah might be worth sending some of that out over the listserv email so that people who aren't at the meeting and don't watch it know that the discussion is being had and other people can chime in. Yeah. Well, thank you. That said, Gian Lorenzo, um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, for those of you who um, haven't yet looked at the profile. Gian Lorenzo Meggio is a PhD fellow at the European Training Network for Industrial Digi Digital Transformation across Innovation Ecosystems. I think it's pronounced Einstein. And he's great. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Thank you. And I think you're going to be discussing a report you're preparing for the European Commission. So, Gian Lorenzo, I'm going to hand this over to you. Thank you. Well, first, my, my pleasure being here. And thanks for giving me the time to, to present. I'm going to pull up the PowerPoint. So hopefully you can see the screen, the full screen, right? Yes, we can see it. Perfect. Perfect. So let me do this. OK. So yeah, um, just going to start by briefly presenting the project and myself, and then uh, I'm I'm going to quickly move to the to the report, which is the, the main content and why also I'm presenting it today here. So I'm uh, I'm PhD uh, fellow uh, this uh, at well first at Aarhus University, so I'm based in Denmark. Uh, but at the same time, I have this affiliation with UC Berkeley, which is why also I uh, get to know people from Hyperledger. Uh, first, I, I met Daniela uh, and then Tomas just online but still uh we had chance to, to speak uh to speak a couple of times and um i'm part of this european project called einstein so perfect pronunciation it wasn't easy it's a very long <laughs> an acronym um and i'm based in denmark uh, as i was telling you before but there are uh, 15 phd students across the world uh, studying different kind of perspectives on industrial trans transformation. And I'm mainly focusing on blockchain. Uh, why? Because I um, actually started collaborating with the Hyperledger Foundation, which is one of the partners of this project. So this is like the, 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 
background in terms of of the project and, and myself and uh, feel free to like stop me or if you have any question just to 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 let me know and i will stop talking see lorenzo uh, yeah I, I, just real fast on the previous chart i i didn't see moby on there is, is there have you talked with moby or are you going to talk about that in a little bit later yeah actually i have him in let's say in in the pipeline to some extent so i was thinking to speak with them uh but that's great and i also actually i didn't mention it before but uh well first i watched the the, the recording of last session and uh, i think this kind of report could be a nice extension and deep dive in terms of focusing on uh, ev uh, batteries and supply chain uh implementation for blockchain good yeah because we had moby on earlier this year talking earlier this year, maybe last year about digital battery passports and their standards uh there so no said i'll let you continue that's great. No, for, uh, thanks for mentioning it. Actually, I I saw that there, they spoke a couple of times. So one should be this year and the previous one last year. Uh, but I never actually had the chance to get in contact with them. So again, we'll we'll get back to it in a, in a few slides. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. Um, so current research, uh, I started focusing on blockchain voting in the U.S. election. So. Um, there, there is especially one startup uh, that uh, has been using Hyperledger and building a platform on Hyperledger for U.S. elections. They've been quite uh, successful, um, and then they started also working uh, outside the U.S. The same time um, with with Einstein, so with the projects, um, we run this uh, blockchain uh, webinar. A uh, few months ago, and uh, that was involving um, Daniela uh, Marin Jovanovic, uh, who was professor at Copenhagen Business School, and also Doug from from Circular. So, since I wanted to focus more on the uh, let's say the success cases and uh, what could be a, a good implementation case, a good story for reports. Um, with Daniela uh, in, in April, back in April, we started to think about, well, perhaps we could do something on, on supply chain. And why? Because uh, there is this uh, deadline for, for the project, so for the Einstein project to um, develop a, a report by January uh, 2024. And this should be, a, this should, let's say, present a framework on how to manage uh, emerging technologies to, to to make it easier. And so uh, there was this, this um, uh, webinar as well uh, that we run in, Jan in, in June. And then again, when I spoke with uh, with Daniela and Tomas, well, they told me uh, the, the, the supply chain trade finance interest group has been finalizing, has been working and finalizing an ebook. So perhaps um, there is there is room for, for some synergies here. And that's why I also reached out to, to you guys. Um, so very briefly, the, the focus uh, would be uh, on implementations in uh, for digital uh, passports or anyway for uh, uh, blockchain implementations to uh, track and trace um, EV batteries and the materials that are used. Why? Because of course there are some challenges and also some new regulations that are coming up and uh, especially the EU uh, set, uh, officially set one in um, in June, if I'm correct, if I recall it correctly this year. So uh, again, if you have any questions so far, let me know. Otherwise I will just go on. And uh, I was thinking to, um, um, to structure the report uh, around three cases. So I already mentioned Circular. I've already seen that you also included it in uh, the additional projects for uh, in, in the ebook. Uh, and same goes for Mobi, if I recall correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, I see that you excluded Avaledger. Uh, as far as I know, and that's also what Daniela told me, uh, Avaledger is still actually uh, going on. 
So there was a subsidiary uh, mm -hmm. that had financial issues, uh, but uh, she, uh, Liane, uh, who's the CEO of Avaledger, also published um, a blog post on Hyperledger website in September. So um, it should still uh, be a, a good a good case anyway to learn from. Again, why? Because I think uh, uh, what the ebook tells us is uh, what has been working. So what has been the the, the benefits that uh, these kind of cases shows? At the same time, I think that what the report could complement is a perspective on what are the challenges anyway to scale it, for example, but anyway in the implementation in uh, in high volumes of of these kind of solutions. So this is like the take that I would like to yeah. give to the report. Yeah, and uh, maybe Jean Lorenzo, as you're speaking, we included circular, as you noticed, Moby's in there also. Um, one of the things that we've we struggled with is getting numeric benefit from so circular solutions. So dollars and cents, euros and cents, <laughs> right? In some way, shape or form. I mean, yeah, there's 10,000 users or, you know, we have, uh, 5,000 SKUs that we're tracking or something like that. And those are those are good. But what's been challenging, though, is, hey, by using Circular, aka also, you know, blockchain underneath the covers, we've been able to save X number of dollars. Or we've been able to increase revenue because now we do it so easily and the customer believes in it and says, okay, now I understand how you as an organization are actually doing that work. Right. And so I trust it more. And so now I'm going to buy more from you as opposed to somebody else. So we have not gotten that kind of information from Circular. From yeah. Jeff, you're probably, well, Jeff, you're probably smiling because <laughs> you did a lot of work trying to figure that out and couldn't figure it out. Well, there was a couple of problems with the main one was when you're doing ESG and you come back and say, you know, uh, sourcing, responsible sourcing, and then they come back and say, now we're doing responsible sourcing, not using child slave labor and, um, you know, we can track to make sure they're not doing that. And you come back, well, what's the benefit? You must have been using slave labor before, right? <laughs> I'm yeah. going to admit that, you know, we, we couldn't track it before and that was going on. Now we can track it, to make sure that it's not going on. But, you know, how do you go back and say, we reduced a lot of labor by 50%. So um, the thing that you pressed on, Tom, though, is um, there's no, in my mind, what I've seen, there's no doubt that there are some of these folks that were using this technology to say, we can now really track this. And so the whoever they're supplying can then verify also that in our materials we have we have uh, confirmation that we're not using is environmentally sound and so things of that nature and so we're getting a customer from somebody else that can't um yeah it's hard to get that maybe it's too early yeah it it, it may but gene lorenzo just wanted to bring up that point that i mean we want these things to be real solid I mean, there's plenty of hand waving and using blockchain, plenty of hand waving. And uh, the more solid we can make it, and that was one of our very key uh, aspects of how we uh, chose who was going to be in here and who wasn't going to be in here. So we'll leave it at that and let you continue here. Yeah, I just yeah. do, do want to add one comment on Everledger. Yes, thank you for bringing up the financial issue that there was the bankruptcy. Um, we didn't see anything from third party talking about new clients or anything like that. So it was hard to see if the company's continuing operation, is that true? Are they truly an ongoing company or is this just something that they're, that they're saying in order to continue waving their hands saying we're here? And we Maybe. didn't want to include anything that we weren't confident about. And Maybe we need to invite them to uh, come and speak in uh, January, February. Yeah. I mean, I did try reaching out to them a few years ago um, when I was working on something and couldn't even get an email response. Uh, so, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I, I, I'll be interested in seeing what you're able to bring, bring to the conversation about them and what they're offering you. 
And just to clarify, these are examples. So um, I mentioned Everledger and Silk Road because I had the chance to speak with both of them once. Mm -hmm. So I had like a call with them, with Doug and Lian, uh, some few months ago. Uh, but uh, again, might be that other cases are are let's say more fitting or more ready, whatever. Um, it's just that yeah. as I already had some contacts, I thought that these ones are the ones that I could actually go uh, go for. And mm -hmm. in case if something didn't go well in one of these cases, learn from it. So if if something didn't go well, why? Um, right. Again, in, in this view of like also understanding what are the challenges mm -hmm. uh, that companies I might face. Are you really focused on Hyperledger platforms or are you also looking at non-Hyperledger platforms for this? No, uh, I, I would like to focus on Hyperledger because because of this partnership with projects. Okay. okay, very good. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so again, uh, thanks for the, uh, for the feedback on this. And I think that totally makes sense, uh, the kind of uh, rational the drivers that you that you followed for the ebook. Um, so, just to give you a um, uh, an overview of the structure that uh, we had in mind, um, what uh, what could be the the first few sections are on the technical and business review on blockchain and blockchain and ecosystems platforms. Uh, the first one I already done it. Uh, second one is something that I'm gonna do. Uh, and then there is uh, this kind of focus on on the case studies, and and finally on the framework. So as you may see, it's like a, it should be like some some uh, brief report, uh, nothing nothing too long. Uh, there is uh, here an example that uh, that I um, that I share here, just in terms of like the cover. Uh, this one was on the key ecosystem legitimization attributes. And there were a uh, few people uh, collaborating. <clears throat> so uh, uh, how to how to uh, let's say put it in, in in practice and in terms of timeline, um, the first things the main priority would be to have this kind of uh, desk research or perhaps also uh, scheduling a, an interview with, uh, for example, someone from Circular. And and have a ledger and Mobi as well, uh, if possible, within uh, let's say mid December, early December, and in the meantime, start to writing something about the cases uh, based on what's online, and and then finalizing the um, the this framework that I was talking to you before uh, about and. Uh, and this would be the deadline would be 10th of January in terms of um, the first full draft should be shared with the consortium. And the consortium means all the industrial partners that I showed you before, plus the, the universities. In the meantime, uh, again, it's not just me, there are other people involved, and there are people from this working package, for example. Uh, here are uh, people from the other working package. We have other five to six people, mainly professors and, and PhD students involved in my working package. Uh, and so we can get some, some feedback from, from them as well. So uh, bottom line, uh, last, last question, last slide. Um, as you may, oops, as you may be uh, actually more expert than me. So I'm a researcher. I started focusing on blockchain and, and studying this, these cases uh, one year ago. Um, you may have contacts or data about, uh, for example, these cases or other cases in, in this um, in this area, or might you be, uh, or you may even be willing to contribute uh, writing wise. What does it mean, for example, uh, writing few pages on 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 circular uh on what they've been doing and perhaps uh, uh helping me in uh, in conducting the interview uh which i think would be just one which if of them one with each of them uh again the main focus of the of the um, uh, of the interview might be uh some numerical benefits 
uh, but might be even more actually what are the challenges that they are facing in uh, um, in implementing and scaling these these solutions. So if you have any other feedbacks or if you are interested how and in, in contributing, uh, just let me know. And in case, of course, this would be uh, um, reflected in the authorship of the of the reports. So that's it. Interesting. Um, Thank you. Gianluigi, I just want to make the suggestion. If you go to our wiki, on the left-hand side of the page, there was something, the ebook. It was a working page on the ebook, and that includes early drafts of profiles, not just the ones that ended up in the book, but a number of other ones as well. So you'll be able to see who who wrote what. So if there's anything you have questions about in our ebook, you'll be able to see from that who was working on it so that you can reach out directly. Perfect. Yeah, a lot of them yeah. were were um, Tom, Jeff, me, but also Ned Thompson wrote some, Daniela wrote one. There were some other oh, people who submitted one. different yeah. ideas. There's a conversation at the bottom of the page about a lot of things as well. Great, that thanks. Might be a good resource. Yeah. And with, the, with each of the key ones, or the the primary ones, let's put it that that way, um, where we felt like we had numeric benefit. It was in production, et cetera, et cetera. There's also a additional uh, additional material, whether that they came and presented to the SIG, or in a couple cases, there's a Harvard Business Review uh, link that was done. Or you know, you, we try not to do press releases. Because we wanted it to be a little bit more factual, as opposed to, uh, you know, hey, we we have this greatest thing since sliced bread here. <laughs> you know, they have their place and they're needed, definitely. Um, I had looked at Everledger quite a bit when we started this, and um, <clears throat> and somebody told me that they had gone <laughs> going out of business. Yeah. They were their big thing. They were into uh, reducing forgery of uh, cosmetic lines and very high end items like purses that cost those purses, I guess that cost thousands of dollars. And right. so there's a no verification system to show that this is not a, a forgery that was made $5. They were big into that. And I, Back in 2016, um, 2017, they launched the Chai Wine Vault, which was collect collectible oh, great wines. Yeah. And and I think they even got involved in some liquors. But for that, they, there were they were also working with IoT devices to ensure that the bottles themselves hadn't been compromised. Yeah. yeah. Then they were working with a Cha Tai Fook or one of the other big Hong Kong jewelry companies as well. Yeah. So there had been a lot of great projects that were announced. And if it hadn't been for the announcement earlier this year about the bankruptcy, like I would have been like we were it would have made a great case study, but the bankruptcy caused some concern. Yeah, yeah that's why oh. Vinisher, a company like Vinisher turned around, I don't know if it's related, but then they put in, after Circuit went out of, uh, and it's coincidence, but went out of business, that's when Vinisher walked in and said about the wines. They were mm -hmm. to track these wines, temperature and pressure. I did find out why they why they use pressure, by the way. Just what you touched on, Alicia. Mm -hmm. Why, if somebody opens a, a wine bottle, you're changing the pressure in that wine bottle. That the more the corks can open. It's going to be that important makes to sense. point out important that garbage sense. and report it. <laughs> oh. um, so, so Gian Lorenzo, are you, do you are you getting what you uh, look for? I'd be happy to provide feedback if you know to a draft copy or something like that. You know, you, that that could definitely be something here. Yeah. I and mean, we have lots yeah. of material clearly available. I would do the same. Yeah, it's all the same. it's all open yeah. source, so you're yeah. it, you can use it. Right. That's Perfect. in part why I wanted to suggest looking at that page because you'll see a lot of things that that were were shared already, so that you're not reinventing the wheel. Exactly. Exactly. And um, a couple of uh, follow up questions. One one concerns the. Um, the suggestions that you may have uh, concerning other cases, for example. And I was speaking about EV batteries, uh, passports, let's call it them way, uh, this way, um, because of the regulation. So mm -hmm. even though they might not be, let's say, profit, profitable or whatever, uh, 
someone has to help companies to to get this kind of passports because this is what regulation is gonna is gonna require actually is already requiring mm -hmm. um so um, this just to explain better why why this case or why this specific uh deep dive uh but again uh do you have any kind of um, names in mind or contacts uh in case uh for, that you... for batteries i think of moby and tramvol mm -hmm. i mean if you want to send me an email specifically with what you're doing, I can then send it over to Moby and ask about introducing you. Perfect. Yeah. So, so, so on the use case topic, I, there's something that I've been beating my head with a little bit, uh, and I knew it was going to go in the ebook, but um, um, using the SAP model, a lot of people use still SAP, so. SAP was sold on the concept of if you put this system in, which may cost hundreds of millions of dollars, you're going to eliminate all this applications out and we're going to reduce our costs. Is there any, has anybody looked at the use of fabric for supply chain and so forth? And does it, if it's brought into a company, that's blockchain as a service or actually brought into a company, what happens? Does it reduce the IT footprint corporations? Those are big use cases because there's a lot of maintenance and a lot of over manual costs supporting applications, and companies are always looking to reduce that footprint. The whole idea of the cloud, the whole idea of a lot of stuff. Is is, is there anything out there? I search Hyperledger website or the pages left and right to find out are there any use case examples of somebody bringing in, I shouldn't say bringing, but using blockchain, and also now we can toss 20 apps. That do this work. And I haven't are, seen anything on it, but are, it makes sense. Those are big companies see that kind of stuff and they jump all over that stuff. And SAP is sold on that concept. It, it exists on that concept. Consolidation of your application never really turned out that way, all right. the way, but um, um, that's a monster. That's still a monster. Why do people, why does the shift to the cloud? It's the infrastructure right. reduction and things like that. So bringing in blockchain software. For supply chain um, mm -hmm. a couple of years ago there was a gs1 trial with data being exchanged between ibm food trust and ripe.io and i think sap their blockchain and food logic i think it was food logic from their platform which was not blockchain showing that the data could be transferred between these different platforms. I suspect that for, for companies that worry about losing market share to these newer blockchain, platform, blockchain platforms, showing that they can be interoperable is important so that they don't. Yeah, I, looked this, I looked at this to be know, blockchain for the, for the climate accounting group. Yeah. And uh, they okay. should be sued for false advertising. <laughs> really? They do not have a blockchain, no. Who doesn't? No. SAP. Oh. What they're touting. They do not have a blockchain. <laughs> Gotta be sued for using that word. <laughs> what they're promoting out there is not. They're trying to retrofit that ridiculous system of theirs into that concept. Oh. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a joke. And if you think about it technically, they can't. They put themselves out of business. Yeah. <laughs> so, Gino Lorenzo, do you, any of your use case? Uh, thoughts or looks in your work around displacement or, or, or rationalization of applications, reducing of applications when they utilize um, blockchain or fabric for, for supply chains or anything else? Not really, not really. Again, uh, in terms of uh, supply chain sector, I basically just started uh, looking into it. Okay. So uh, I I know quite a lot in terms of like coding uh, implementations, but it's much less on, on supply chain. Uh, yeah. When I worked at uh, VP, there's a whole logistics group, massive, uh, or there still is. And they, you know, they had supply chain software all over the place. Tons of apps um, for different parts of supply chain, logistics, truck, truck management, rail management, inventory management systems, just a, a plethora of those things. And uh, time, trying to time all together and, and report out of them accurately. Massive challenge. Maybe, yeah. yeah. Sorry, yeah. I, I need I need to leave, uh, guys. It's so after the hour. I'm, I'm going to break here. Thanks, Gina Lorenzo. I'll let you uh, 
you continue here and then we'll look to hear certainly willing to provide feedback for my personal self here um on things so thank you thank you okay thanks, yeah. thanks bye yeah and we are a couple minutes after the hour so we do wanna yeah oh right, okay yeah. Except, except. Uh, just, just want to tell that there might be actually an article written by Tomas on, mm -hmm. on a similar uh, topic. And uh, very last last thing, I'm, I'm sharing the, um, the, the link where there are other deliverables uh, that might be interesting for anyone who could be interested uh, online now uh, or from the community. And mm -hmm. here are some of the examples of previous deliverables. That's it. Thank you well, so I see much. It out there. Yeah. Yeah. Are you comfortable with my putting the link to that in the page for for today in the wiki? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Thank sure. You. Sure. Thank you. And I'll, I'll share it there as well. Yeah. Now this this sounds like a really interesting project. I'm looking forward to reading it. I just want to echo Tom's sentiments about I'd be happy to look at a draft and and make comments. Um, and like I said, send me an email with a brief description of what you're what you're working on and what you're looking for, and I can forward that over to Moby and ask permission to intro you. And uh, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah. So at least I'm gonna some ideas that I'm coming up with for 2024 things to work on or stuff that I was actually gonna start just looking at you know, because of my interest as well. Some of the stuff I was putting in a spreadsheet. Okay. Oh, that's a good that idea. Many. I'm just going to listen. <laughs> well, no, why don't we put it on the wiki so that people can access okay. it and so that people can can see that we are talking about it and we're looking at different ideas. So, Jim Lorenzo, you had a, a, when you were showing the uh, table of contents, you had one about a technical overview um, on that, so on that you... deliverable. Is that you had a list of in your uh, the agenda or sorry, the table of contents on your presentation just for, I think number two was a technical overview. Oh yeah, yeah, excellent. Yeah. That that's the one was that, that I very, did. was that deep technical overview or was more of a uh, um you know when I you know um you mean by deep, in other words, the software now verifies this information, the software consists in the certain memory pools. Um you know, it's always a question around transaction speed on private blockchains, but did you get into that kind of stuff where there's no What's the speed that it comes through on? Uh, how does it get? How does consensus work? In private yeah, no, blockchain, it's, it's always a question. People always have interest in how does consensus work in a private blockchain? Since there's no, there's no gas rewards, there's no miners. <laughs> um, I, is I it briefly, that level or? I briefly touch upon this. Uh, it's more like okay. a, an introduction. So, what are the main um, feature? Well, first, what is the definition? What are the definitions of each com concept in the definition of blockchain then also some a few words on consensus mechanism on, okay. uh, on the type of blockchains and that's it okay yeah i i know two people work for companies who uh, talk blockchain and they, they come out and they, and they see the stuff in the media and they say yeah well, that's so complicated you've got these coins and you've got miners no 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 that's public there's a private blockchain like your private software right what is that? Thing? There's just confusion about. Now, I wonder how high that goes up in companies. Like, I'm not going to do that. And see what it says here about the value of coins and they're issuing coinage and electricity usage and consensus about all the. Like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's two. That's pri public blockchains. Right. It's never discussed that difference ever. I just wonder how you touch on there. Okay. Yeah, David's, David's or, laughing. A friend of mine some... at a Canadian company asked me to create a class to present to some of his clients, helping them understand the different blockchain issues and why it might be helpful to their company. So I, yeah. I've sent him a syllabus for like a two hour intro to this mm -hmm. stuff to help the executives understand. Yeah, what a private blockchain is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That said, it's eight okay. after the hour. I want to be mindful of everyone's time. Jim Lorenzo, thank you so much for coming. And presenting. Yeah, we look words, forward to hearing more. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Uh, My pleasure. Right. With that, I'm gonna I'm gonna end the recording. Thank you everybody for watching.